welcome to the 129th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday, the 13th of August, 2020, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. Today, we have the first part of our interview with Professor Issa Bloomy, Professor of Turkish and Middle Eastern Studies at Stockholm University. We talk about his 2018 book, Destroying Yemen, What Chaos in Arabia Tells Us About the World. The second part of the interview will be released in a couple of days as a Patreon-only podcast. This week, I have the new patrons to thank, Hayden Taylor, Mac, MK Hobson, and Carl Dick. If you like the show, perhaps you too could become a patron. Patrons get two patron-only episodes and live streams every month, there are regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote on the next reading group series. Okay, enough commie grifting. Let's join the interview. So, Isa, thanks very much for agreeing to speak to me today. I recently read your your book, Destroying Yemen, What Chaos in Arabia Tells Us About the World. Now, I knew nothing about, very well, I won't say nothing, but I knew very little about Yemen, even though I've been kind of following the war, but from a position of, honestly, of slight confusion at the complexities of the war. Can you give us a kind of a, an opening, kind of a talk about what Yemen was, say, going back to like early imperialist times or maybe even the pre-imperialist times in Yemen, what was its economy and its politics in that region and beyond? Well, firstly, thank you for initiating this conversation. Uh, it's increasingly difficult to find uh, an interested medium or let's say interlocutor to reach out to people I think are very concerned about the increments of information they get about Yemen. It is as it was already in 2015 when the coalition initiated their campaign to subordinate and discipline a, a resistant population in largely the northern parts of the country. It has been a human catastrophe and the scale is most likely the largest uh, one of the uh, 21st century. Unfortunately, uh, the powers that be have a great deal of a vested interest in making sure that this story is not circulating widely. And recent distractions have certainly uh, facilitated that process. So I'm very grateful that you're giving me the time to talk a little bit about this uh, very tragic story. Yemen is, however way it is interpreted and explained, in uh, various uh, medium uh, in the last 15 years or so has always been posited as something somewhat of an outlier, marginal place in the world, impoverished, backward, kind of cliches that serve uh, very well the kind of narrative that's ultimately dominating how we talk about Yemen till today. Uh, Where in fact, what, what is actually happening is disguising the fact that Yemen has long been identified as the prize, if you will, in various imperialist projects over the last, let's say, 300, 400 years. Yemen and the peoples who inhabited South Arabia have thrived in a, a, in a global sense for millennia. They have been part of the first communities to have expanded trading networks, which have had consequences culturally, linking Southeast Asia, South Asia with East Africa. And Yemen has been right in the middle of this larger Indian Ocean world, which is now getting more and more attention in Western Academy. And it's certainly getting more and more attention in the strategic terms of global empire whether we frame it in the capitalist periodization, that everything starts with the rise of North Atlantic capitalist interests in the 17th, it's even going back to 16th century. Yemen was already a major player in a global sense before Europe became, or let's say Northwest Europe became a major player in the larger world. The larger world was a thriving kind of complex of trading communities, exchanging cultures, exchanging ideas. And Yemen, again, has been in the center of that. Now, what constitutes Yemen, geographically speaking, is actually a very, are very different territories with very different long-term histories, which maybe contributes to why Yemen today has a, a kind of a zone of conflict and a zone of global financial capitalist expansionist interest needs to be somewhat flushed out. Again, the epicenter of the Indian Ocean world, 
Uh, the epicenter of this phenomenon of Islam as it expands from the uh, neighboring region just north of it. Some of the first populations to convert to Islam uh, were the same peoples who are already entrenched in the global uh, networks of trade and cultural exchange, which accounts for why Islam very quickly spreads from an isolated area of southwest Arabia to the larger world, um, largely on the backs of these uh, Yemeni-linked networks of trade and cultural exchange that, again, extends all the way to China, all the way to southeastern Africa. So all these places in, like you said in this book, I was quite surprised when I, I didn't, hadn't realized it before, like Malaysia, Indonesia, even Singapore. Is that is the Islamification of these countries, is it coming from the Yemen? The primary conduits of the spiritual transformations of these societies were through what we would call Hadrami families. Now, Hadrami is a reference to the Hadramaut, which is a large region I'd say to the, the southeast of Yemen, if one were to look at a map today, there's this vast territory from east of uh, Aden, which is the old British uh, kind of colonial outpost after 1839. Those territories extending from the coastal areas and deep inwards into the Arabian Peninsula, or what we would call Hadramaut. These are agriculturally very rich areas. They get seasonal rains. Uh, currently, as we are speaking, there these are areas that are heavily flooded, unfortunately, and lots of damage is being done at the moment. But these are agriculturally very rich areas that have been, been able to sustain large populations, settled populations that have farmed there, but also because they are seafaring peoples, they've been able to bring the products they were producing in large amounts in these areas and sell to the larger world. And while the links were there prior to the rise of Islam, when these people became Muslims themselves, they brought their culture with them to Sumatra, to the Malay Peninsula, to India, and the other side of, of the South, Southeast Asia in the South China Sea. So these were the first ones to bring Islam as trading communities uh, to these regions. But I suspect they were already settled. Uh, members of their fa extended families had already settled there before Islam in these regions. We know that in Madagascar, for instance, the peoples, the indigenous people speak a form of Malay language, which links them to South Pacific, which is very interesting. The peoples of Polynesia speak a related language to those who, who are um, in, in Madagascar. So one could imagine the kinds of networks that are established by peoples who find themselves in the middle of this cultural exchange, which is Yemen. Yemen is at the heart and center of this larger Indian Ocean world. And they've been there prior to Islam, and they certainly uh, were thriving with the rise of Islam. And they brought that with them as they um, continued to trade with all corners of the Indian Ocean world. It's a long way from, it's a long way, I was in Madagascar a few years ago, it's a long way from Madagascar to Fiji or, or some of these oceanic islands. What a remarkable human story that is completely suppressed mm -hmm. in, in the narrative. And this goes back millennia, right? I mean, the links that we have between Madagascar and the Malay people go back several thousand years. And how they did that, they did it through sea. Uh, they had mastered the winds. So they were able to sail under the winds, as they say. Mm -hmm. And so those Dao, the technology that allowed them to sail all seasons throughout the Indian Ocean world, certainly ha helped Yemenis in their homeland, which was very rich in certain kinds of spices, spiritually very significant, uh, and it's a reflection of how Yemen became very wealthy. It was wealthy for its own reasons indigenously, but because it was able to capture and, let's say, re-harness its access to the larger Indian Ocean world, it became a major player also in uh, what we call today Western Asia or Middle East in the Mediterranean world. There was, one, there was one little snippet you said in the book, there was a fact that really struck out to me was that I think it was prior to in the British or, or other imperial forces having bases in Yemen, that Yemen was actually in trade was siphoning gold and, you know, silver from Western imperial nations in, in trade they were losing to the Yemen. It shows how developed their trade must have been at the time. Well, Yemenis had things that Europeans coveted, and the same applies to India and China. These were all countries that had balance of payments issues with Europe. Europe was constantly hemorrhaging money, silver and gold, to these rich societies in Asia. 
whether it be in the Eastern Mediterranean, which ultimately becomes the Ottoman Empire, or Yemen, which also draws the attention of the Ottoman Empire as it also hopes to expand in these very lucrative trading zones. But as, again, the story that plays itself out in 19th century China and India, it also plays itself out in the Red Sea and the Western Indian Ocean, which includes, it has to include Yemen. Now, what makes Yemen somewhat different is that one very unique role that it's, it, it could actually survive the onslaught of, and it did survive the onslaught, first of Portuguese piracy, then the Dutch, the Portuguese who had controlled large parts of the Gulf, the Persian or Arab Gulf, in the, this period when they had circumvented Africa, always looking for resources, whether it be new sources of gold, but more importantly, trade products like spices that were incredibly valued in, in basically a Europe that had no flavor. It, it, I like to frame it in those ways to my students. But, I mean, they were completely blown away when they first got access to the spices that the rest of the world had been able to thrive and, and benefit from. But equally so, when the Europeans secure the trade routes westward to the Americas, they're bringing now entirely new products to the larger world, whether it be tomatoes or cocoa beans or these other things that completely transform how the world eats or how the world understands what beauty is. Um, it goes both ways. And Europe, unfortunately, by the rise of the Portuguese, have now a huge surplus of gold and silver which they proceed then to um, figure out new ways of financing enterprises like those commercial shipping expeditions to the Indian Ocean that would lead ultimately to a conflict, a violent clash between the Portuguese and their indigenous peoples of the Indian Ocean. British East India Company is formulated, the Dutch East India Company are formulated, and they follow very quickly afterwards. And so now the Yemen world becomes part of this larger scramble for the wealth of the East, which was what initiated Columbus's expedition in the first place, gaining direct access to the, the spice markets of the Asian world. So happened to find the Americas in, in the way, and that's completely transformed as we speak, the, uh, as we as understand it today, the capitalist world, the, the Northwest Atlantic world, that uh, Northwest Europe, that transformed its relationship to its uh, neighbors to the east. And then Yemen would be somewhat implicated uh, very uh, quickly into this process. Many Yemeni fa trading families managed to negotiate with these newcomers from uh, Northwest Europe, became intermediaries, partners, as well as rivals. So you see this slow over several generations of introduction of European capital into these areas that were once exclusively Indian Ocean trading networks realm of influence. So Yemenis learned very quickly, especially those along the coastal areas, the Hadrami, learned very quickly how to deal with these Europeans coming with their galleons uh, around Africa in the 17th and 18th centuries. And by the 19th century, which really starts our story about modern Yemen, especially with the British, they, they, they invest in an entirely new kind of system of a relationship with Asia, which is one of conquest, of quite literally physically dominating India, Southeast Asia, and Yemen became a necessary point of connection. Aden was a small, modest trading post with some cosmopolitan um, uh, inhabitants, prior to 1838-39 when the first British East Indian Company representative signed a trade agreement with the local ruler. But very quickly, it became a necessary conduit for British East India Company ships to distribute influence in both the Red Sea, which became a, a kind of a, a zone of conflict between the Ottomans, the British, the Italians later on, the Dutch, et cetera, et cetera, and the larger Indian Ocean world. So Yemenis who began to incrementally see the shifting tide, if you will, of global trade. They were very keen on not being shut out as British uh, military technology allowed them to suppress and undermine rival shipping, let's say, enterprises. They quite literally would go and bomb rival trading communities throughout the Indian Ocean world. Many Yemenis decided to forge expedient economic alliances that turned into political ones which allowed the British East India Company, and by 1850s, the Raj in Bombay, to basically make 
as an extended outpost of British empire, British capitalism, South Yemen, uh, or Southern Arabia. So the British kind of, like not famously, but famously if you're in Indian or Chinese, when they came into, when they basically invaded and took power in those countries, those countries had large, vibrant e economies. And within like literally decades, they were a fraction of their previous size. Did Yemen manage to maintain, like did it manage to avoid that fate of the Indian and Chinese states? Crucially, there was, this is where the geography of Yemen is important, that I discussed more, almost exclusively at this stage, just southern parts of Yemen. There's the mountainous northern Yemen, which were very, very wealthy in agricultural sense. Um, they were, let's say, the suppliers of uh, some of the commodity products that were highly valued in the global markets prior to the rise of the British East India Company and then British Empire in the 19th century. Coffee, for instance. The first shipments of coffee through the Ottoman Empire's territories to the European markets originated from Yemen. And so they certainly benefited from the influx of gold and silver to purchase this highly valued drug, basically, right, that was ingested in several forms by both Ottoman and larger European markets by this stage. So ironically enough, one of the first measures taken by Europeans was to try to find alternatives to this one source of this highly valued, very expensive commodity. So you see the Dutch, for instance, starts working with Hadrami Yemenis, planting in Sumatra, for instance, or Java. And we now, uh, of course, know and refer to coffee often through these islands in, the, in East, East Asia, as the sources of our coffee, where in fact they are originally coming from this Horn of Africa, Yemen area, and Yemenis were the main beneficiaries of this initial hundred years of craze over coffee as the drug of choice at the time. Eventually, coffee beans then gets sent to the Americas, and various actors in the capitalist world of Northwest Europe start to tap into indigenous commodities and try to basically undermine the monopoly that Yemen had for just this one product. There were several other products that similarly made Yemenis, even in the northern highlands, quite wealthy. But what makes northern Yemen especially unique and interesting is that it also was able to set the terms of its relationship with global capitalism uh, very early on. These are areas that, as we know from the war since 2015, even though if you have the most expensive military in the world and you have mercenaries from the U.S. and European countries and Australia, you still can't defeat a population that is willing to fight for their freedom, for their right of access to their own resources, et cetera, et cetera. So certainly in the early modern world, no one could have hoped to conquer northern Yemen. So Yemen, northern Yemen became this kind of important point of leverage that Yemenis in the northern areas could always negotiate, and they successfully did with the Ottomans, to keep British actors at bay, keep the Dutch at bay. And primarily the British, by the middle of the 19th century, become almost exclusively active in this part of the Arabian Peninsula, and their adversaries were the Ottomans. Unfortunately for the Ottoman Empire, by the 1850s, they had themselves become indebted to European banks. And so you see, begin to see a, a modification of their policies vis-a-vis -vis the British in regards to these outer lying areas of the Islamic world. But nevertheless, the, the Ottomans are there. They, they, in political alliance, in economic alliance, and therefore military alliance with several key actors in northern Yemen, they're there by the 1870s, and they're, they're a bulwark against expanding capitalist pressure, if you will, that has already infiltrated to much of the larger Indian Ocean world. So here, the geography of Yemen really starts to differentiate. You have the low-lying low uh, coastal areas that are commercially now dependent on the, the British-dominated Indian Ocean trade by the 1850s. The markets for, in, for Yemeni products are now really occupied by British the Dutch, and the French to a lesser extent throughout the Indian Ocean world. So they have to negotiate with the British in different terms than the northern Yemenis who can remain and indeed have gravitated their economies and their cultural connections to the larger what we call the Middle East, northwards. And that would eventually include much of the Ottoman Empire. 
it, it's interesting, like at, during this time, Yemen is the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula and it, it does get rains and it's quite a rich agricultural place. Like north into Saudi Arabia, who today is like hegemonic in that, you know, in, in the Arabian in Peninsula, were they kind of like a, a backward, you know, desert, remote tribal kind of a place at that time? Or like, was the environment as rough as it is now? So here is the interesting part about Yemen's geography. Yet one more layer to the complexity is that a large portion of this northern Yemen, these mountainous areas, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures, but if people just type in Yemen mountain villages and you just see the spectacular uh, stone towns built on top of mountains, and you can see the fields that have been terraced, just like you would see in Philippines or in Southeast Asia, Yemenis also practiced this form of agriculture uh, in these very difficult terrains. That extended actually into what today is Southwest Saudi Arabia, an area called the Asir, which basically leads up to basically the borders of what today is that the holy areas of the Hijaz, Mecca and Medina. Mecca and Medina and the whole coastal area of the Red Sea of that Western part of Arabia had culturally been very, very distinct from the Eastern part of Arabia what today constitutes Saudi Arabia's eastern territories, Kuwait, Bahrain, the UAE, and Qatar. Those areas were had a very different kind of, let's say, geographic orientation. Their agriculture was very different. They were very, I wouldn't say primitive, they were very sophisticated with the environment that they had available to them, but they were certainly not part of the larger global economy. They were very isolated some of these desert communities of Eastern Arabia from which Saudi family comes and they ultimately make their political alliance with Wahhabism can really only germinate in these isolated areas. Yemen, on the other hand, was part of the larger world, very cosmopolitan. It, its territories, again, extended deep into what today is Southwest Saudi Arabia. And it, it was very much connected by trade the annual uh, migrations that come with the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, Medina, they all go through Yemen. So much of the Islamic world in the Indian Ocean part, and much parts of Eastern Africa, they're going through Yemen to reach Mecca, Medina. Yemeni territories, culturally, the peoples that associated and affiliated themselves with Yemen extend basically to the border of this area. And if you can visualize on the map this area that is now in Saudi Arabia, southwest Saudi Arabia, the terrain is basically an extension of northern Yemen. And culturally, until 1934, this was Yemen. This was identified by any of the geographers who had traveled these areas, the linguists, they would identify and associate this with Yemen. Yemen, until today, are fighting this war with the ultimate promise of recapturing so they have this kind of expansionist ambitions on their own right that has been at play since the 1930s. And what was happening in the 1920s and 1930s is the British Empire basically invested in the Saudi family. They had three primary enemies in the Arabian Peninsula as British imperialism and capitalism is now identified the region as oil rich. Strategically, it's very important because of the Suez Canal, which the British were able to occupy by 1882, thanks to indebtedness, the, the Khedive of Egypt, who was once, was once part of the Ottoman Empire, went bankrupt and, and be, basically had to surrender key areas of sovereignty to its creditors, in this case, the British occupation of the Suez Canal. That makes the British now a global power in all its terms by 1882. And Yemen strategically becomes almost of insurmountable importance. And they started to invest heavily in what we today we would call Salafism or, uh, or Wahhabi Wahhabi. Islam. It's not by mistake that with British occupation of Egypt, they also occupy Al-Azhar, which is the main center of training for Sunni Muslims in the larger world. So you begin to see from the 1890s onwards a generation of imams coming out of British-controlled Egypt who are now disseminating and finding partners in places like Eastern Arabia which is a, a new battle zone between the Ottomans who are controlling Kuwait, Iraq, these whole areas, what Saudi Arabia doesn't really exist yet at this stage. It's only formulated in the 1930s, formally as a kingdom, recognized as such. So all this time you have multiple polities 
with the Ottoman Empire in control of Mecca and Medina, it has these commercial and political alliances with these peoples of northern Yemen that extends all the way to the borders of Aden, which is really the enclave in which the British really have any kind of influence over at this stage. In comes World War I. The British and their allies induce a, a, a revolt amongst certain elements of the population in this part of Arabia, especially around Mecca and Medina. Symbolically very important that the British now rulers over India are basically the biggest Muslim power in the world. And they are keenly invested in assuring that Islam is shaped in a way that cohabitates well with British capitalism, with British values, and more importantly, with British assumptions of authority. So there's a, I can give you a list of, of books that, could, uh, that would uh, substantiate this initiation, if you will, into how global capitalism through British imperialism makes its way into Southwest Arabia. Is it Mark Curtis has written a, is it, is it a British journalist? Written a yes, I, I'm familiar with it. I cite it in the book, actually. Yes, he is one of those who make this at, at a kind of popular level. There are some scholars who have now made a very in-depth analysis of some of the institutions that are emerging, some of the personalities that are emerging in this Salafist Wahhabi world under British tutelage. And it's not by mistake that the Saudi alliance, the alliance with Saudi kingdom emerges under British protection, British money, British weapons, British advisors. So by the middle of the 1920s, the Saud family can make its first territorial push into traditionally very, very cosmopolitan Islamic territories of Western Arabia. It's in the 1920s when the Muslim Brotherhood occupies Mecca and Medina for the first time desecrates all the sites of Muhammad's family, extended family. And so this outlying, backward, very fundamentalist orthodoxy that's been produced with British, certainly oversight, in Eastern Arabia has become now a territorially expansionist enterprise that pushes out families like the Rashidi. There is a professor there in London. Her name is Rashidi. She's very prominently positioned to be writing hostile books about the Saudi kingdom. Her family, her ancestors were losers in this early 20th century battle between Saudi-British alliance and the indigenous polities throughout the Arabian Peninsula. The Heshemites of Mecca Medina, who ultimately were pushed into Jordan and then Iraq to become puppet regimes of the British in these former Ottoman territories, they also lose out to the Saudi a Wahhabi British alliance in the 1920s. That's the King of Jordan today is a Hashemite, isn't that right? That's right, yeah. So his family, his grand, great-grandfather, made this bad alliance with the British during World War I, promised that they would be rulers of the Arab Muslim world, uh, that they were recognized as such, as being descendants of Muhammad, being uh, the caretakers of Mecca Medina. They assumed that they would be the obvious choice to take over the caliphate from the Ottoman Empire, if it were to lose World War I. And the Ottoman Empire certainly did, but the British, as we know, and the French and the Italians and the Greeks notoriously decided to redraw boundaries to suit their own economic and political ambitions for the 20th century. And the Saudi family was one of those tools of British capitalist imperialism to redraw the boundaries of Arabian Peninsula. And the Heshemites were the major losers, the Rashidi were major losers, and Yemenis were major losers. They would lose large portions of their territory, this Asia region, which by 1934 would be permanently occupied by Saudi forces. And that's part of the battle zone, if you will, right now in this horrible war that's, that's been going on since the 1990s, but really has intensified in 2015 when the coalition was created with the Americans and British oversight. I don't know if you knew, but uh, I think the current King of Jordan, he appeared in a, he's a big Star Trek fan. He appeared as a, as on one of the Star Trek episodes, as like a, with these background ensigns or something. He's a kind of a ridiculous character. Yeah, so his, his uh, even his, four, his grandfathers had already succumbed to British ultimatums and they basically said, okay, fine, I'll, we'll leave our homelands of Mecca Medina and we'll accept mini kingdoms of course, Jordan helped design this project in occupying Palestine. They, they basically divided up the Palestinian indigenous population amongst the Zionists and this new kingdom called Jordan. 
and continuously works to help this, what people are calling neocolonial. I don't see it in any way detached at all from the 19th and 20th century, but nevertheless, it's a colonialist project which British capitalist interests remain heavily invested in until today. And the king of Iraq, which was ultimately overthrown and in, in a process that led to the rise of the Ba'athists and Arab, pan-Arab nationalism in the 1950s. And this also applies to Egypt, which had, a, 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 again, a pliable, a member of the long-established Albanian Ottoman ruling elite under Muhammad Ali, established a dynasty that lasted until 1952 when Farouk was overthrown. Ironically enough, as I highlight in my book, with the help of northern Yemenis, one of the imams' main enterprises was to work with other Arab states to fight Zionism, to fight imperialism, because his father, the, the, the family, had lost out precisely to these British in respect to their territories in the north, what, what is now southwest Saudi Arabia. Similarly, the ruling families of the northern Yemen were in constant conflict with British allies in southern Yemen. The idea is that Yemen should become a single unified polity working with the larger Arab Islamic world to conflict against the capitalist agenda or project that the British were at the forefront of leading throughout the 20th century. So that's the, they're here, this takes us to the 20th century, where there's an apparent paradox that most scholars don't seem to understand is that it's largely because they don't read the documents that are, have been produced by this interaction between the imamate of northern Yemen, the Zaidi imamate of northern Yemen, which until 1962 was a dynasty that had lived in sequence for over a thousand years, maintaining this uniquely autonomous and independent polity that was producing wealth, that was producing uh, wealth, translating that wealth that into scholarship. He was producing a counter-narrative, if you will, to the politics that was mobilizing Islam now to service the interest of global capitalism by the beginning of the 20th century. This was this kind of interesting place that was impervious to the pressures of global capitalist imperialism well into the middle of the 20th century. And that's so, really where my book is, is situating Yemen. It's, it's at the forefront of the last remaining entities of the Arab Islamic world that is resisting on principles that were very hostile to capitalism. That in theory, Islam teaches Muslims to embrace, but has been completely abandoned, obviously, in many parts of the so-called Arabian Peninsula. So Yemen becomes this forgotten space of resistance against global capitalism in the middle of the 20th century. So, like you're saying, in, in the mix of all this, we have like these imams. So the, the one you first kind of zero in on in the book is Imam, forgive me if I'm saying his name wrong, ya, Yaha? How do yeah, I say yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you describe to us like the kind of geopolitical games he was trying to play between balancing forces between the different imperial powers and even the, some of the socialist powers and, and, mm -hmm. and what this process meant for Yemen? The role of the imam is it's, it's very much entrenched in lore and, and there's very explicit and well laid out, legal laid out parameters of legitimacy to whoever is elected to become the next leader of this larger region, this larger community. One, one has to be a scholar. You cannot be illiterate. You have to be capable mentally, uh, but also you have to demonstrate your ability to lead politically as well as militarily. You have to demonstrate your capacity to lead on the ground. And, and, and so this, this individual who basically emerges in 1904 as the imam that will last until 1948, and hit, subsequently his son and grandson would be the last two imams of, uh, of this long dynasty of a thousand years that had success, uh, in succession ruled this part of Yemen, he was able, in a very sophisticated way, maintain a relationship with then present Ottoman Empire, renegotiate the terms in which the Ottoman Empire was able to remain present in this large mountainous territory of northern Yemen that was impossible to occupy. This was not an occupation in the traditional sense. There were Ottoman garrisons, but these were all garrisons that were negotiated to be allowed to come and help sustain a defense, if you will, against any expansionist ambitions of 
the British and more importantly, British supported rivals to these leading uh, communities or leading families in Northern Yemen. So he was able to mobilize the Ottoman Empire, use its resources to balance off any threats from the British. Similarly, he was making overtures to other polities in the, the Red Sea region, including the Italians who had established themselves by the early 1880s in what today is Eritrea, the French, uh, where Rambo, who is smuggling slaves and um, is shooting up and, and smoking opium in Djibouti. There is this very interesting, very complicated world in the end of the 19th century Red Sea in which Imam Yahya has no problem engaging in. So he's able to negotiate despite the clear ambitions of already uh, the British in conquering these areas to the north. One, because they're rich in water, most likely rich in, in minerals that were highly valued in the newly industrializing West. And more importantly, it was a territorially linked to the larger Arabian Peninsula. The British were in control of South Arabia, but much of the trade that was made this part of Arabia rich had to go through Imam Yahya's territories. So um, it was a big problem over the long term for uh, British expansionist ambitions if there was this territorial black hole, if you will, in southwest Arabia. And Imam Yahya and his advisors, many of whom actually were sons, part of the extended family, were able to navigate in a very sophisticated way the end of the Ottoman Empire, which collapses with the end of World War I. This was, by the way, Southwest Arabia was an area that the British were not very successful in during World War I. They lost quite a few battles, or at least their allies lost quite a few battles against Imam Yahya and the Ottoman soldiers that were based there. So after when the Ottoman Empire is broken apart, the British encourage the Saudi Wahhabi fanaticism that's coming from Eastern Arabia in partnership with the British they occupy the coastal areas of what is northern Yemen. And eventually, because it's no longer sustainable, the British have to leave. And this is an important story throughout the 20th century, that there are limits to a capitalist, imperialist project. If it doesn't make money, you have to abandon the project. It's only recently that Wall Street and others have figured out that they can manipulate central banks or that central banks are willing to just print money hand over fist to sustain, in a very socialist way, right, sustain uh, big Wall Street uh, companies at the expense of the future of, of their societies. In those days, you still had gold back and silver back currencies. Eventually, if you kept subsidizing these inefficient, bankrupt trading companies, the burden would fall back on the mother country, if you will. And Britain was increasingly being drained of its wealth, trying to sustain these not necessarily lucrative trade routes. Uh, strategically, Britain had to uh, basically rescind its direct occupation of these valued territories. And Yemen sat in the middle of this. Yemen was too expensive in the long term to sustain a hegemonic or at least an ambition to be hegemonic in the way that we understand capitalist imperialism in the 20th century. And this accounts for why northern Yemen was able to navigate the post-World War I period. It formed political uh, and commercial alliances with the Italian companies. It was one of the first entities to sign a treaty with the Soviets in the Soviet Union, which people forget, and it's very interesting in that regard. The Soviets in Moscow understood and appreciated that as the British expanded their influence with the Saudi Wahhabi enterprise, that British uh, influence in Central Asia was going to expand and pose a long-term threat. And the fact that Imam Yahya understood this, supposedly isolated, backward country, impoverished, agricultural-based economy, and nevertheless, this, the, these people are traveling long distances, making overtures to newly created polities in as far away as Russia, as far away as Southeast Asia, tells you that there's a very complex network of flow of information. It's hard, almost impossible to find and discover what they were because the documentation doesn't exist anymore. Maybe there is a big cache of documents out there that one finds and then we can flush this out more better. But we do know that spiritually and commercially, Northern Yemen is still integrated because of it's able to latch on to the trade networks that are sustained by British imperialism. 
because it maintains trade links that is established itself with the Italians across the Red Sea. And so by the 1930s, Imam Yahya is heavily invested in the intrigues of the rapidly transforming European theater with the Soviet Union, the rise of fascism on the other side, how British imperialist industrialists are navigating this, and with the arrival of the Americans, which I, I discuss with the book. Really the first one representing Standard Oil, representing the Rockefellers, a geologist who will ultimately become the founder of Aramco in Saudi Arabia, starts his career looking for oil in North Yemen, rightfully under and understanding well that the geography promises that there's huge mineral wealth in northern Yemen. Imam Yahya initially is, you're welcome to come, explore, do your thing. He increasingly became very suspicious. This guy was simply spying, that he had ulterior motives, that he was ultimately making it possible to geographically map out an area that was still very, very unknown to the capitalist world. And he ultimately threw him out. And it's, 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 a, it's a stunning story of foresight. This guy understood that this American was up to no good. He didn't trust the, the, the morality of these people. He was very much drawing his responses to these initial forays, if you will, of Anglo-Saxon capitalism to that these people are just not moral. I can see that they don't believe in God. And that was the criteria for Imam Yahya, which to us in the tw late 20th century is not the kind of tool set required to fight global capitalism. But this was the intriguing possibilities of an alliance, if you will, that was reiterated once again with Gaddafi, reiterated once again with the Iranian revolution in 78, 79, that there were actually moments of, of intersecting shared interests and shared moral responses, ethical responses to global capitalism that existed in large parts of the world that today we are, we're taught are antithetical to each other. So it's not by mistake that they, uh, there was actually lots of ground for negotiation between Marxists and those who are, were beginning to try to articulate a way and a response to the rise of global finance capitalism. Because finance capitalism is, in Islamic terms is pr precisely the critique that we would get from uh, those who came from the political left, if you will, in the Western world. Uh, the, the criticism of finance capitalism its terms of exploitation, its means of exploitation were precisely the same. So Imam Yahya is this traditional ruler who's fully embedded in the theology of Islam, particularly of Zaidi Islam, is also a demonstrated leader on the battlefield, as well as a politically astute man, is able to keep Northern Yemen out of the crosshairs, if you will, of global capitalist imperialism and survives World War II. And how does, the, how does the imam develop over the next 20 years before its fall? There were attempts by the British and others to incite rebellion. There was an attempted assassination earlier in the 30s. Ultimately, he would succumb to injuries from an attempted and for a brief period of time successful coup, if you will, in 1948. But quickly, his son, Imam, who eventually became Imam Ahmed, was able to re-secure power and consolidate power through this northern Yemeni territory. So from 1948 until 1961-62, you have the son of Imam Yahya, his name Imam Ahmed, and he's especially an intriguing character because he will very explicitly reach out to this new movement after World War II. He and his administration, under uh, he was leading a delegation to New York to become a member of the United Nations, which I write about in one of my ch chapter three, I believe. It's, it's mostly in the, in the end notes of, the, of, the, of that chapter, but there's lots of materials that are coming from the British, uh, sorry, the American State Department, desperately trying to seduce this new actor in post-World War II Arabia. The United States is still shut out. They had just successfully weeding Saud away from the British. They're able to insinuate Aramco a little bit into Arabian um, territories. This Tutwiler guy who had been thrown out by Imam Yahya in the 30s has established himself as the main advisor to the Saud ruling family. 
about how we can make you a very rich man by exploiting these resources in the Eastern Arabian Peninsula. So the Americans are keen on getting this southern fringe. The British still have control of the crucial states, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, what becomes the UAE, Oman is under the British sphere of influence, and the whole swath of Southern Arabia through these political alliances with local rulers, the British still have some influence east of Suez in the 1940s and 50s. But here is still this entity of autonomy, of independence, northern Yemen, this imamate that has successfully survived an attempt through political violence, is now under a new ruler who is sending delegations to New York to negotiate whether or not Northern Yemen becomes a member of the United Nations. It's, and I lay it out in the book, and, and, and there's some very interesting exchanges that go between the precursors of the CIA trying to seduce and blackmail through the old stories of sex and drugs and alcohol. And they're frustrated because this guy who comes from Yemen is very principled. He doesn't want these parties, while his Saudi neighbors have very quickly fallen into these kinds of traps and have embrace the idea of being wined and dined by the American State Department. So they're, they're scratching their head. They're wondering, what can we do to break this, this hold on, of northern Yemen's autonomy? And it's persistently stated publicly in these forums, like the United Nations, that northern Yemen, the imamate, one are hostile to co the colonialism, to Zionism. Zionism is a, a threat to the larger Islamic world. One of the first ones to publicly condemn the creation of the Israeli state and then proceeds to make political alliances, not only with the continued alliance with the Soviet Union, but make overtures to larger movements that are happening and are emerging in this, in the so-called third world, the rise of the non-alignment movement. One of the first ones to open discussions for the creation of a pan-Arab unified state was North Yemen. It was one of the ones, the first ones to support the Free Officers Movement Revolution in 1952 that removed King Farouk and ostensibly removed British influence from Egypt was Northern Yemen. And incrementally throughout the chapters three and four of my book, I'm telling the story of how, again, no one understands this in these terms, but Imam Yahya in Northern Yemen, a backward, quote unquote, backward Islamic state is leading, is at the forefront of progressive attempts by mostly secular leaders in Egypt, in Iraq, in Syria, what will eventually become Algeria, to form a unified state against global capitalism. They are making overtures to Indonesia with this movement towards the Nile movement that will eventually include India, and there are even overtures to uh, Maoist China. And so by the mid-1950s, you have all these countries represented in northern Yemen. And even though the country does not do much international trade, it has very limited gold resources, it nevertheless it has the rest of the world all eager, competing against each other, gain access to this geographically essential part of the Arabian Peninsula. And he has basically has the Soviet Union, the Americans, the Chinese, the Swedes to build infrastructure. They build these impossible highways through these, these incredible mountainous terrain that it would have cost billions and billions of dollars today to do. And he basically says, if you want to have a good relationship with me, I'm, I'm open to hear what you have to offer, but first you have to help develop our country. The Soviet Union builds their main port, Kudeda. The Americans are offering to do the same just further south in a place called Mokha. The Chinese, in over three years, have not only built this amazing highway that still exists today, uh, that connects the Red Sea coast to the highlands of Yemen, but they also, as the Soviets would do, brought Yemenis to their universities and trained them. And Imam Yahya, I'm sorry, Imam Ahmed negotiated with these countries to say, "You, we have to build capacity that you build our, our roads, but you also train our my subjects to learn how to maintain these roads." So. In this period of time, he was able to negotiate the uh, ambitions of competing global powers to actually build infrastructure and train the next generation, if you will, of Yemenis who would then be able to take over the enterprise of running a modern 20th century state. 
this, unfortunately for him, would be a generation who would be indoctrinated by the ideas of modernity and the ideas that we need to break free from tradition and embrace consumption habits like those that they saw when they were traveling the world, when they went to Beijing or to Moscow or to Cairo or to other parts of Europe. They fell in love with that kind of life, and they wanted it back in their homeland. And they would be the f first generation of what we call revolutionaries who would ultimately try to establish a republic in 1962. And they would be seduced. They would get the resources. They were pro given promises, and they staged a coup that ultimately led to the death of Imam Ahmed. And then the struggle with Imam Ahmed's son, what we will eventually call Imam Badr, the last imam of, of northern Yemen, who would lead a, a, a counter-revolutionary struggle for the next eight years. And he would ultimately fail and end up in exile, living the rest of his life in, in London. So I was looking, in, in your chapter there, you said that, like, so this was a coup led by some uh, Republican officers, which established the Yemeni, or sorry, the Yemen Arab Republic, the YAR. And that Badr led the counter-revolutionary forces. So the, the, the different forces were backed by surprising elements. So al-Badr, so the new, the latest imam, the last imam was supported kind of, to my eyes, kind of counterintuitively by Saudi Arabia, Israel. The monarchists, so the British as well. Yeah, the British, yeah. And then you had the Soviets and the Egyptians essentially backing the Republicans. It seems like quite a strange split. You would have thought that the Saudis would have been interested in the fall of the Imam. Well, they were. It was quite clear in the documentation that as they negotiate with the British, especially with the British, you could find it in British archives, that they, under no certain terms, that they would not see the, the return of Imam Badr. And it became clear to Badr himself, but he had really had no choice. His supply chain for weapons and for fighters, had to go through British-controlled areas, so he had to play along, even though he knew very well that they were, he was being sabotaged, being used, if you will, to thwart this expansion of Nasser, Nasser's influence in Southwest Arabia. Egypt's investment in this, what became known as this uh, civil war in Yemen, northern Yemen, was upwards of 70,000 troops at one point. Now, what, where my research has, what has successfully done, I think, which again, all it took was some looking into the archives, which for whatever reason people have neglected, especially the American ones, it was not necessarily a Nasser sympathetic group of officers who initiated this coup. Again, the way that Northern Yemen interacted with the larger Arab world, up until middle of 1961, the, the Egyptians at least on paper, were in alliance with Imam Ahmed, with the Imamate. Because, again, northern Yemen, even though they were a Muslim power, not a secular one as supposedly was being advocated in Egypt and in Iraq and in Syria, by 1961, Syria and Egypt, what had been a unified Arab state, had fallen apart. The Syrians had grown tired of Egyptian imperialism or some form of it, they had really uh, lost much of control of their economy as Egypt claiming to be the leader at the forefront of this uh, revolution, if you will, of united Arab progressiveness against the British imperialism. That alliance had broken apart. And that's basically when Imam Ahmed and northern Yemen itself broke from this larger world of progressive pan-Arab uh, unity against a combination of global capitalist forces. So it really didn't take that much time be between Badr, who was then the crown prince, who had spent much of his 1950s traveling around Moscow and Cairo and the progressive Arab world in the 1950s, late 1950s, early 1960s, 61. North Yemen was even providing safe haven for people like George Habash, who were leading the struggle against the British in neighboring Aden. So Imam Ahmed and his crown prince, his son Abadr, were actually until late 1961 supporting the resistance in Aden, allowing for soldiers to come into their country and then infiltrate British zones of influence, what was eventually the federation of the southern, uh, southern Yemen. And so until late 1961, then, then the break happens when Syria breaks apart from Egypt. Clearly, Nasser has gone in a different direction. 
I discover with the emergence of JFK that the Americans see Nasser, at least under JFK, Nasser as the useful counter narrative, if you will, to global communist propaganda. That if you could find progressive actors who were hostile to British imperialism, hostile to the Zionists, remember there was this, there's this big controversy over whether or not JFK was supportive of the Israeli state or not. Uh, there are all kinds of speculations about the extent to which Israel was hostile to JFK and we're happy to see LBJ take power after his assassination. So with the death of JFK, the relationship that the Americans have with the Arab world also dramatically changes. And Nasser himself is dramatically, uh, let's say, marooned in a world that becomes a quagmire. It's the Vietnam for Egypt, right, is Yemen. The, the, the soldiers are dying there. Clearly, they have control of the cities, but do not have control of the countryside. The, the countryside is still behind the old imam. And this is what terrifies LBJ, the British, and the Saudi family. The sustenance of this continued independent northern Yemen that has, over the long term, ambitions to recapture lost territories in the north and to continue to struggle against the British and its allies in the South Arabian Union, whatever it was called, uh, the coalition, if you will, that will ultimately lead to the throwing out of the British and the rise of the South Yemeni Socialist Republic from 67 onwards. So even at the height of the so-called Cold War, that's pitting the monarchists, uh, quote unquote, against the, the Republican progressives who had all got their education in the Soviet Union or Beijing or in, in continental Europe under Imam Ahmed's supervision, if you will, or approval, they cannot form a republic. And ultimately, they have to go back to conservative elements to find some way to end this terrible war that had cost hundreds of thousands of deaths. So the transition from the imamate to the Republican period, where there are multiple actors trying to gain control of this chaotic period, collectively, even though they may be at opposite ends politically and over the long term have different ambitions for North Yemen, they all agree they don't want to see the imamate return. And um, therefore, the imamate and the families that had supported the imamate will uh, suffer uh, as a consequence for the next 20, 30 years, persecution, humiliation. They would lose much of their, their wealth, their, um, their access to their lands. And you would see a, a dramatic shift, not necessarily towards republicanism per se. There was an interim period in the mid-1970s where you had a principled leader who was going to push for a continued Yemeni financial autonomy and independence from the global economy. But he will ultimately be assassinated and the capitalist powers, if you will, and the Saudis finally get their man in this Ali Abdullah Saleh. Takes power in 1978 and would rule until 2011. On this episode, you heard the team tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats.